Well, church family, if you would turn to uh, the third chapter of Jonah this morning. Four chapters, so today marks the three-quarter point here. We're going to uh, work our way through these next couple weeks, uh, the end of Jonah, and then that brings us to uh, Christmas. And we'll have a few weeks to talk about the nativity and to fo- really uh, bore down and focus on the birth of Christ, uh, get our hearts around uh, the Christmas season. So that's always a, a joy for me as a pastor to be able to go back to the, the birth of Christ. But for now, we are in Jonah chapter 3. And if you remember Jonah's story, just as a bit of context background here, uh, God had come to Jonah, asked him to go to a place called Nineveh, which is uh, was part of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, he wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh, a truly dark and pagan place, and he wanted Jonah to call on them uh, to preach out to them their sins against them. Jonah did not want to go, so he chose to run from God instead of being obedient in the mission or purpose that God had laid out for his life. He ended up on a boat running from God to a place called Tarshish, which we believe is somewhere in uh, southern Spain. Uh, So he's heading across the Mediterranean in the exact opposite direction of where God had wanted him to go, like many people do in life. Maybe it's a a proverbial boat in your case, but we all end up at some point in time on a boat heading in the opposite direction of what God's desire is for our life. It did not work out so well for Jonah. He chose to bury himself in the deepest place in the boat— and try and sleep off God's presence. The conviction of God was so heavy upon him, and the, 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 um, the, the hostility and discipline of God was so heavy upon Jonah that the storms raged around the boat that he was on in the Mediterranean to the point where the pagan sailors were saying, please, whatever you've done wrong towards your God, will you just make it right? And Eventually, they throw Jonah overboard so that they don't die. The seas calm down, but Jonah sinks in the ocean, and God swallows him and allows a large fish to swallow him up. We talked last week, you remember, we ended with the idea that the fish was, yes, God's discipline, but also the fish was, yes, God's deliverance. Jonah would have ended up a dead, drowned, washed up, seaweed smelling good for nothing in the bottom of the ocean if God had not sent that fish. So God not only disciplined Jonah, but God saved Jonah in the midst of his discipline. We don't think of God's discipline that way often enough, but when God disciplines us, it's because he loves us and it's because he wants what's best for us. He wants to see us saved, not floundering not dying in ourselves. He wants to see us saved. So that's where we left off. Giant fish swallows Jonah. Jonah is now in the belly of this fish. And we we find out that he he prays out to God last week for uh, deliverance. He, He prays that he once again knows that he's going to see God in his temple. Jonah begins to experience the redemption of God last week. So today we come to Jonah chapter 3, and this is the point I want to get across to us before we read the text. God is a God of second chances, is he not? Sometimes those second chances apply to those people who have been in rebellion, Uh, those maybe who have not met God yet and they're choosing to rebel against God. Sometimes it's to those who know better and know God and still choose to rebel against Him. It made me think of uh, the rebel John Newton this week. Here's such an interesting cat, John Newton. You know, he wrote the the song Amazing Grace. And... um, Despite being raised by a Christian mother, he chose a different lifestyle other than God's best for him. He chose to run slave ships back and forth to England. 
And in the midst of doing this, in the height of the slave trade, he became saved in the midst of a fierce storm that was threatening to drown his ship. Uh, and he called out to God. And he felt like he was delivered at that moment. Later, we see that God's plan for John Newton was fulfilled. He, he not only was he saved in Christ, and he wrote this beautiful hymn that everybody knows and sings, but God would use him as a minister in the church, and he would use him in conjunction with another man in England at the time by the name of William Wilberforce, who was the key in eliminating the slave trade in England. John Newton was the spiritual influence on William Wilberforce to get rid of the slave trade once and for all in England. It was a mere nine days before John Newton's death that Parliament voted to abolish the trading of slaves once and for all. So we know that God works in the lives of those who rebel against him. And often, God uses those who are redeemed in him to administer his second chances in their life. There's some people in your life that God is calling you, like Jonah, to go and administer second chances. And in our, our own rebellion, we're giving God the cold shoulder because it seems too uncomfortable or it'll be too difficult or it's too much work or you know, they're too obstinate or they're too far gone. You know, it's not, I can't do that, God. And God's looking to use us. Who else will go? He's looking for the redeemed to be his whale, his fish, in order to save somebody else. So what I want to give you today as we read the text is God's plan for rebels, but God also has a plan for the redeemed. We see that play out here. Jonah chapter 3 Beginning in verse 1, it's only 10 verses, but it enlightens us to the work of God's plan for Jonah and in the Ninevites. Verse 1, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Father, we come to your word today, and we seek your plan for our life. God, I pray that wherever somebody may be today, that their heart would be receptive to the work that you desire to do in and through them. I pray that we would see the greater work of redemption above everything else that we see in somebody else's life, that we would see that you are the God of second chances and that there is no one beyond the saving arm of the Lord. I pray that 
you would find faithful people today who do not count themselves as unworthy of suffering for the gospel of Christ, but that you would find people who are ready and willing to arise and go. And if there's anybody here this morning, Lord, who is in a state of rebellion from you, you would speak to their heart, draw them to yourself, and that today would be the day that they would be saved. Speak to us now, according to your spirit, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. God's plan for the redeemed and God's plan for rebels. We're gonna, we see them both play out here. The redeemed is Jonah. The rebels are Ninevites. God's plan for the redeemed, as we see in Jonah's life here, and this is the first point, God's plan for the redeemed is always, always a life of obedience. God desires obedience in us. God's plan for you is not to, you know, say, oh, well, I'm saved by grace, and then find this big bubble or cushion of grace in your life, and then just wallow there, right? Like, oh, I'm forgiven in Jesus, I can do whatever I want, you know? And, and just sort of wave our hand at everybody like we're on a big fat Christian float going down the parade route. And we're just like, hey, life is good. That's not God's plan for us. God's plan for us is that we be obedient in the calling that he has on our life. And if you're unsure what the calling is on your life, I'm a firm believer that God calls individuals to individual work in the gospel. But the gospel is the unique, common calling of every Christian. It's the Great Commission. One thing I can say about everybody in this room is that you have the calling of God on your life to go and make disciples in the name of Jesus Christ. We cannot disobey in that. We must not. Now, how God goes about doing that in each one of our lives has its unique uh, it's un each person has their unique giftings and, and your life and your story have their unique plot twists and turns. Uh, but the calling is the same. Make disciples. That's what we do. Let's compare God's first instruction to Jonah in chapter 1 with the instruction to Jonah after he was puked out by the whale on the beach. Jonah 1, verses 1 and 2. This is way back at the beginning of the book. Very first verses we read. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, we look at what we read today, and it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. What has changed in God's call in Jonah's life? Nothing. It's the exact same. That's what I want you to get. It, Jonah has run from God. He's, he's hid in a boat. He's brought danger upon other people's lives. He's been a terrible witness to pagans on the boat. He's sunk into the ocean. He's, I mean, he's been left for dead. He's been swallowed by a fish for three days. He's had a long conversation with God in the belly of the fish. I personally have never been vomited out of anything, but Jonah has. He's been vomited out of the fish onto the shore, and here he is now. And after all the changes that have gone on in Jonah's life, God says to him the exact same thing. So is God in the compromise business? No. God says do it. We do it. Now, what has changed is Jonah's response. Because in the first encounter, what we just read is followed with, so Jonah rose to flee. That's what it says. The next thing, Jonah rose to flee. In this encounter, it's followed with, so Jonah arose and went. My question for us today is this. Are we fleers or are we doers? We put a lot of energy into fleeing God's desire for our life. If we took that same energy and put it into doing, the church in America would look a lot different. 
Now, obedience isn't always easy, is it? Most times, I, my, my experience with God is that when he calls me to things, there's, there's usually hiccups and hang-ups and difficulties and speed bumps. And why? Because God's not just looking to accomplish some mission. I'm the mission. The person that God calls to do the work. Jonah was the mission as much as he was the instrument. God is building a man of faith in Jonah as much as he is saving those Ninevites far, far away. His desire for us is obedience that takes us to a place of faithfulness that looks like a growing Christian. The fruit sometimes is, I think, secondary to God. I mean, God wants to see people saved. God wants to see his church grow. God wants to see the influence of the church increase in the United States of America. But God also wants to see Larry grow to trust him more on a daily basis. That's what obedience looks like. When God says, do this hard thing, and you say, "Mm, that is hard, but I'll do it because I trust you. That's pleasing to God. Pleasing to God. So when Jonah arose, and instead of fleeing, he chose to go, that pleased God. But obedience isn't always easy. Sometimes, maybe it isn't supposed to be easy. Nineveh was hard. I think Jonah knew this. That's why he fleed in the beginning. Jonah was 550 miles from Nineveh. That's a a healthy walk is massive in size. Scripture says that it was a three-day walk just to get from one side of Nineveh to the other. It was massive in size. It was massive in population. And beyond the scope of one man's comprehension. Nineveh was full of God-haters. Nineveh was full of sinners. It was full of violent and vile people. It is rumored that back in the day, there was not a more hateful, violent, fortuitous lot than the Assyrians, and Nineveh was their capital. And God said to one man, this massive city, and God says to one man, I want you to go. You're going to walk like a, Jonah walks like a day's journey into downtown Nineveh, whatever that looks like, and he begins to preach. And what's his message? <laughs> it's not a lot. Uh, we just read it. There's probably more to it, but the crux of the message that God wants us to know is this. Jonah walks into downtown Nineveh and says, 40 days and the whole place is coming down. Explanation. That's it. Um, if, if God had said, this is the message I want you to give to Sarasota. I want you to go to uh, some pineapple statue down, downtown. And I want you to stand there. And I want you to tell everybody that um, the city will be destroyed and everybody's going to hell. Um, I might look for a ship too, right? But here he is. He, he's finally obedient. God's message to the Ninevites is judgment. Nobody likes to preach that. Judgment's coming upon them. This is very much a message that should have gotten Jonah killed. Jonah might have even believed that he was on a suicide mission. Because when God said, arise and go and give them the word that I tell you, and then let's just assume that somewhere on that journey of 550 miles, God said to him, oh, by the way, here's the message. Judgment's coming. And you're all going to be destroyed. Jonah probably thought to himself, (laughs) yeah, me too. I'm going to be killed too. 
Yet now, God had allowed Jonah to go to such a dark place that he understood. Here's what I mean by go to a dark place. Where was dark place? A belly of a fish at the bottom of the ocean for three days. That was Jonah's dark place. God had allowed Jonah to go to that dark place so that he understood that Nineveh and whatever God had called him to in obedience there could never be as dark as the belly of that fish. Whatever God calls us to is never as scary and as dark and dangerous as being apart from the presence of the Lord. It is never as dark and dangerous as being disobedient to the call of God on your life. Does that make sense? I, I want you to get that. There's two scary places going on here in Jonah's mind and heart. There's where God had allowed him to go apart from him in the belly of a fish. That was awful. So awful that in his proverbial statements that we read last week, he referred to it as Sheol, L. And yet, now God says, I want you to be my messenger preaching judgment to the most violent people on the face of the earth. And Jonah must be thinking to himself, well, I've been to hell and back. This cannot be as bad. Here, as uncomfortable as it is to have conversations with people about judgment and hell and sin and the saving message of Jesus Christ, as uncomfortable it is, as it is for them in that moment to hear about their own sinful state, it doesn't hold a candle to how uncomfortable they'll be in hell. And hell never ends. Our obedience, when we obey God in these things, it speaks to what we believe about God. God calls us to hard things, and we do them, it communicates something about what you believe about. If God calls you to a hard thing and you say, I don't see how this is going to work out, it's going to hurt a lot, and uh, hmm, uh, God, this makes no sense to me, but because you called me, I will go. That says a lot to me about what you believe about God. You believe that he is the answer in everything. You believe that victory is found in him and him alone. You believe that obedience matters more than anything else in your life. And that you live in awe of God. I can look at a person's life and quickly surmise their attitude of God by their obedience. Because... Who believe God, this is the Bible, not me. To believe God is to obey God. John 14, verses 23 and 24, the Lord Jesus uh, said this. It won't be on the screen because I added it in. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Uh, that's a hard teaching, isn't it? Whoever loves me keeps my word. What does that mean? Whoever loves me does what Jesus wants them to. It makes me think of the story told in Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those guys? So Nebuchadnezzar had created this huge gold statue that he wanted everybody to bow down and worship. And if they did not worship the gold statue of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, they would be thrown into the fiery furnace and burned up. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
are commanded to bow down and serve the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. And this is what happens in Daniel 3. They say to Nebuchadnezzar, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They were content to die if it meant obeying God. You know how the rest of that story went, right? Nebuchadnezzar's like, hey, we threw three in. Why are there four? There's an extra one in there. There's another man in the fire. They're not burning up. And he's like, hey, guys, come over here. Look, I, we threw three guys in here, and there's a fourth one in here, and he looks like the son of the gods. They're not burned up. Nebuchadnezzar calls into them. He's like, you guys okay? And they, they come out. They don't even smell like smoke. But three come out. But they saw four in the fire. Because when we're faithful to obey God, Look, I'm not promising that God calls people to obey him and, and they die for it all the time. If, Nebuch, if, if, if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have died on that day, God would not have been any less God. Uh, but God honored their faithfulness on that day as a testimony to himself. He could have, if you think about this, not to devote too long on this, story of these three guys. He could have just left three in the fire. And they could have come out unharmed, not smelling like smoke, and everybody would have been like, wow. So why put the fourth in there? Why, why Jesus Christ in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Because God wanted people to know it was him. God will do things in our obedience that may not ever point to you, but will always point to him. This, this whole thing with Jonah, it's not about Jonah. It's a shame the book is even called Jonah. This, this whole book, this whole thing is about God. So we know that God did work, does work through obedience. And uh, through the obedience of these three men in the fire, he did the work. And we know that later, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, was forced to recognize God's hand in this. So God's plan for the redeemed is a life of obedience. But the second thing I want to draw out here this morning is this. God's plan for the redeemed is to be his message bearers. To be his message bearers. God told Jonah, I want you to go, arise, go to Nineveh, and give them the message I tell you. He said, the message I tell you. Um, we, we are all message bearers. We refer to ourselves as evangelists. Is that, where does that word even come from? Well, in Evangelism, or evan it doesn't show up in the Bible, but it's got three very biblical words in it. At the root of the word evangelism is the word, in the middle of it, is the word angel. Angel is uh, the word for message bearer. That's what angels always did. The prefix you in Greek means good. We, evangelizomai, means that we are, I'm sorry, I mispronounced that, uangelizomai, it means that we are the message bearers of the good news. So when God says, I want you to go to Jonah and give them the message that I tell you, in the New Testament, I can tell you confidently what that message is. God wants us to go and bear the message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just that you are being judged by God in your sin, but that you are being saved by God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Be glad that your message isn't just Jonah's. 
that you're just not going around to everybody going, you're going to hell, nothing you can do about it. Mm. No, our message is repent of your sins and be saved because Jesus Christ died for you that you may live forever with him. Jonah was tasked here with setting aside his heart. He, he, he didn't like pagans, certainly didn't like Ninevites, he didn't like the Assyrians. God's saying, I need you to go. I need you to set aside your heart, your opinions and judgments on these people, set it aside and go. And focus on the message. I'm so glad that God saves people that I don't like. Because nobody would get saved. I'm so glad that God saves people that are of different political persuasions than I am, because I probably wouldn't go. I'm so glad that God saves people who are different races and speak different languages than I do, because I probably wouldn't go. And you know, the crazy thing is, I've led somebody to Christ in Russian I've led somebody to Christ in Romanian. I've led somebody to Christ in Spanish. And I've led somebody to Christ in English. I've led somebody to Christ who is younger than me, who's older than me, who's poorer than me, who's richer than me. And the amazing thing about all of that is that if I was left to my own determinants as to whether I would go or not, I wouldn't because there are too many differences. But God said go, so I went. And I don't speak Spanish. I don't speak Russian. But yet God used me along with translators and other tools and Bibles in other languages. These people were ready. I wasn't even good at what I was doing. It just went. And people got saved. And that's not to brag on me at all. That's to say that God um, wants us to be message bearers. And when we do it, just watch what he does. We come on Wednesday evenings sometimes to our outreach update meeting. And if you've never been, you need to come from five to six because it's really uplifting. We talk about the cool things that God's doing and how, yes, we talk about how we're reaching our neighborhood. Now we could do more things to reach our neighborhood. But we also tell stories of the great things God's doing with the lost around us. And then we pray for the lost. And in the coming year, we're going to bore down a little bit more on that. Um, my heart's desire is to have a, uh, uh, what's the right word? Like a, a, a prayer hit team that um, is going to get journals next year. And we are going to, we are going to focus on lost people by name. And we're going to come uh, a couple times a month together. And we're going to, we're going to journal these names and we're going to pray over these names during our outreach update time. And we're going to really focus on being message bearers. I mean, you, you can't just pray for people to be saved and not be motivated to go and share with people the message of the gospel. But more on that a little bit later. So, so it is with, with each of us. There's one gospel message, one gospel message we preach and we bear it. God says to Jonah, take my message, not take your message, not Take what parts of my message you want and modify it to make it more comfortable for you. God said, take my message. There's one gospel message. Paul even said, if there's another gospel out there that somebody is preaching, let them be anathema or let them be cursed, he said. He said, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Stick to it. Don't change it. Don't water it down to make it easier for somebody. The truth is the truth, whether it's hard or easy. Um, I just want to share with you a testimony here real quick to make this interesting. Uh, and so I don't sound like I'm rambling here. Um, years ago, I read uh, the autobiography of Billy Graham. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it. Um, but by 1950, Billy Graham uh, had already been an evangelist uh, with Youth for Christ. He had um, held several of his early crusades. Um, he was the youngest president of Northwestern College. 
yet he was deeply troubled in his beliefs. Did you know that Billy Graham had a crisis of faith? He did in 1950. He was doubting his call as an evangelist. He recently had a crusade in, of all places, Altoona, Pennsylvania, and as Billy Graham himself had said, it was a huge flop. At the same time, his good friend um, named Charles Templeton, uh, who also had been an evangelist with him at YFC, went through his own crisis of faith and walked away from his relationship with Christ. He went to school at Princeton, there's part of his problem, and he began to view the Bible as he began to view the Bible as flawed and unreliable. If somebody begins to do that, you hear these words coming out of them where they begin to question the validity of the word of God. They're in a dangerous place. That was Templeton. His influence on Graham was growing, and the word Billy Graham was to preach was causing him to doubt that very word. In this moment uh, of salvation, in this moment, Graham is doubting the word of God. He's beginning to wonder if it's reliable, and he's beginning to question his call to preach. In the balance is hanging literally millions of salvation. Invited to speak at a retreat center in California that was called Forest Home, Graham reluctantly accepted because he was having this struggle in his heart. While he was at Forest Home, he spent a great deal of time studying the Bible, and he kept seeing the same phrase pop up over and over again in his studies. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And he fell under conviction. It became a turning point. He realized in his heart that God's word is divinely inspired and eternally powerful. So one night at Forest Home, he walked out into the woods and he set his Bible on a tree stump. And he said at that time it felt more like an altar. And he cried out to God these words. This is what he writes in his autobiography. He says, Oh God, there are many things in this book I do not understand. There are many problems with it for which I have no solution. There are many seeming contradictions. There are some areas in it that do not seem to correlate with modern science. I can't answer some of the philosophical and psychological questions my friend Chuck and others are raising. And then Graham fell on his knees. And the Holy Spirit moved in him and he said, Yet, Father, I'm not, I'm going to accept this as thy word by faith. I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubt. I will believe this to be your inspired word. That was it. He nailed it. He, he nailed that doubt into a coffin at that moment. According to his autobiography, his preaching of the message the next day was different. 400 people gave their lives to Christ. And one of his mentors, Henrietta Mears, she was there and she said this about Graham's preaching. She said he preached with an authority that he never had before. He had surrendered fully to God's message and God's plan. In his life. Why tell you that? When we are obedient to preach the message of God's truth and not waver from it, God will do amazing. He will, I believe. It. Amazing might just be seeing your lost friend come to Christ that you never thought would be saved. Or it may be thousands in the city of Sarasota coming to Christ and filling this church. I don't know what it is, but God can do it. Real quickly, as we wind this down, points three and four, we talk about rebels. So Jonah goes into Ninevite, and God has a plan not just for using Jonah as the redeemed, but he has a plan for, you, for reaching the rebels in Nineveh. Point three, God's plan for rebels is to fall under conviction and turn from sin. A person is saved after they realize that they're a sinner and that they need to repent of their sins. What happens in Nineveh is God-sized and amazing to us. This is a massive city of pagans. 
turning to the living God in repentance, the hardest of people in the world, falling on their faces in prayer before God. I want to live in such time. To turn to God, Jonah must have preached enough in his message for them to believe in the living God. The people from the greatest to the least in this city, they call for a fast. What's beautiful is they call for sackcloth and ashes. It, the, the sackcloth and ashes is just an outward expression. It's a sign of their um, terrible grief and their utter despondency. They understood their sin and they turned. So, I don't know if you caught it, but when we read it, uh, let me see, just for um, humor's sake here. Uh, the king's decree in verse 80 says, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. They, they were so despondent and under such conviction that it wasn't just good enough that they cover themselves in sackcloths. They covered their animals in sackcloths as well. I think if they could have built a tent out of sackcloth to cover the whole city, they would have done that. Um, they understood their sin and they turned. This is the heart of Christ, by the way. Um, in Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time uh, is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is how people are saved. They repent of their sin and believe in the gospel. The king calls for this. Animals are covered in sackcloth. People are wailing. They're probably throwing ash on their heads. They're fasting and praying. This is nothing but the working of the Spirit of God. And if the Spirit of God falls on people in conviction, look out. Look out. Through the faithfulness of just one man, cities like Sarasota could come to their knees. He did it with Nineveh, and they were bigger than this city. And they were way farther gone than we are. Not that we're not pretty far gone. But just one man faithful to preach repentance, and the city falls on its knees. Last point this morning. God's plan for rebels is to turn to God for deliverance. On a whim, I had never studied this before, but on a whim this week, I looked up to see what Jonah's name means. Does anybody know what Jonah's name means? It means dove. Dove. Dove is God's symbol of deliverance and peace that he provided through Noah. God's doing the same thing through Jonah. He's offering an olive branch to the Ninevites, which they took him up on. And here's why this matters. God is rich in compassion and desires deliverance for his entire creation. He desires you and I to be doves in the lives of those who are hurting and stuck in their sin and death. 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Though extremely wicked, God's desire was to use Jonah to bring deliverance to the Ninevites. In verses 9 and 10, I love this. The, uh, at the end here, what's their attitude? You know, they, they're, they're sackcloth and ashes, and they're praying, and they're repenting, and they're fasting. And the king says, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish or may not perish. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Why? 
because God's desire is compassion. God's desire is forgiveness. God's desire is mercy. God's desire is relationship. God's desire is redemption. Bottom line, to sum up this sermon today, I want you to see God's heart through Jonah towards the pagans in Ninevite. God's desire for Jonah in his rebellion towards him, God's desire towards everybody on the face of the earth is redemption. Redemption. Not hate, not wickedness. God's desire is not more pain. God's desire is not punishment. God's desire is redemption. It's his desire that none should perish, but that all should have eternal life through Jesus Christ. We look at God and we say, mm, he's, so, he's so angry, or he's so this or that or the next thing. Mm, no, God loved the world so much that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What does it mean he sent his only son? He took his perfect son, Jesus Christ, allowed him to become the lamb, the sacrifice for all man's sins. He hung on the cross, not so that we could be punished, but so that he could be punished in our place, so that we might experience redemption that we do not deserve. I want you to see Jonah's life here and the work that he was doing and you, uh, you'll remember the name Jonah, but what I want you to remember most is the redeeming work of God. That's what this book is about. And the redeeming work of God is found in its fullest in Jesus Christ. Let's remember that.